All right. How is everybody this morning? Wasn't last night good? Kent and Bev are on. You can leave that going. Um, they're on their way um, with 330 people that they have that they house on their campus. Um, they have a situation this morning. They're dealing with something in court for one of their guys. So um, that's okay. You know, that's kingdom. It's we're having to do what we have to do. And so he was having to deal with that for a little while. So what I want us to do is I want us to stand. And then I want you to begin to pray because I can tell you the oppression and the opposition to us doing what God's saying to do is great, but it's not greater than our God. And it's time for us to, when things aren't going exactly the way we're used to it going, not according to plan, we take a step up. And we begin to move with what the Spirit is doing, moving by faith, not by sight. When you don't know what to do, pray in tongues. Decree the thing that you know God has said, rather than looking at what the enemy is doing. Because it's really easy to get distracted. So just begin to pray in the Spirit. And it doesn't have to be mild. <laughs> Go tell them what he's about to me. If the Lord begins to give you something to decree, just slip up here and begin to decree it. I don't want long prayers, but I want you to come and decree into this atmosphere. Father, we decree that Georgia will rise into its glory state. Georgia will be that governmental gate state you've destined us to be to cause the aligning of nations. We decree that the cloud of oppression over this state is being broken through in the name of Jesus. That there is nothing that will stand against you and your purposes in this state. For your glory is greater than every oppression. Your glory is greater than every opposition. Your glory is greater than division. Your glory is greater than everything that comes against us. We say we rise up. In the power of our of the might of the Spirit. Lord, let the Spirit of might be loosed upon your people. Let the Spirit of counsel be released upon your people. Let the Spirit of wisdom and revelation, of understanding, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord be loosed upon your people. Father, we call for a revival in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not the revivals we've seen in the past, but God, a revival that births a mighty army. A revival that births, births a people that will not relent in the day of oppression. That will not turn back at the gate when the battle is raging, but will charge through the gate. We'll press through the gate. We'll press through the opposition. We'll press through every obstacle that the enemy lays. We say, God, we've seen a vision of you. We've seen a vision of what you want done in this region. And we are stepping in, stepping in, stepping in, stepping in, stepping in. Father, I thank you that you showed me the other day jugs of oil being poured into our hands. So I just ask everyone to hold out their hands today and see the Lord pouring jugs of oil because as Ken said last night, those who the Lord appointed, he is anointing. 
So Father God, we thank you, not just a little oil, you are pouring jugs. And then this morning I saw the angels pouring the jugs of water all around this building. And Father God, we just thank you. We decree today is the day the fire, the match is set to the oil and it goes on fire. And we just praise you that the glory, the fire of Holy Spirit is going to be poured out this morning through your instruction, through your message that you have set us here to receive, Father God. Open our hearts, our minds, our spirits, our bodies, our emotions to receive. I come against all distractions this morning in Jesus' name. We tell the enemy and his distractions to go in Jesus' name. And Father, we pray we will listen intently. We will hear every single word. We will let it be imparted into our hearts and souls, spirits and minds. And we thank you for this amazing privilege. Thank you for bringing Kent and Beverly here, Father God. And we desire what Alabama has, that you bring it in whatever form you want Georgia to have it, Father God. And we give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' mighty name. Father, I thank you that we are your people, that you've chosen us, you put your hand on us, and it's time for us to rise and shine, for our light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon us. For behold, the darkness will cover the earth and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will rise upon you and his glory will upon you, be upon you. And nations will come to the light. Father, we thank you that Georgia is a governmental gate state. We thank you that the clouds of occlusion that are hanging over Georgia and over Atlanta, that the light of the body of Christ is penetrating that. We declare and decree that we will arise and we will shine and we will see your glory in the state of Georgia and we will stand and be those gate posts for the governmental gate that you desire to open up for the nations in this state in Jesus' name. just heard the Lord say, put your hands on your heads. Put your hands on your heads and say, I will receive everything the man of God and the woman of God that has been sent to our congregation, to our ecclesia. And say, I wipe away and I command every fog out of my mind to leave me now. And I declare that I am a receiver of everything that the Lord God Almighty has determined for us to receive today. And we will retain it. We will keep it. We will nurture it. We will meditate on it. We will chew it. And lastly, we will live it. In Jesus' mighty name. I'm going to get Kent up here. But I went over to confirm this. Last night, he said that we were the first of seven states that have invited him, he and Bev, in to speak on this transformational message. And I began seeing this last night. And then again, when we began to pray, if you've ever looked at an old-timey watch, the wheels connect. You've got one, and then you have to connect. I believe we are that connecting point that begins to turn things that will connect to the next. And the more the seven connected to the eight, to the one, we make eight, which is a new beginning for this nation, that we will see the time changing and the timing coming into sync with heaven. So, Lord, we just say today, we sync up with heaven's timing. We sink in to the cycles of time and the moon and the pushing forward of time to be in sync with you in this nation 
in the mighty name of Jesus. Lift up a shout and let's get Kent up here. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Y'all may be seated. Wasn't last night fabulous? It was so powerful. And I'm excited today. I mentioned to you that they were dealing with a court scenario over one of their one of their men. So Bev is out in the car still dealing with it. We <laughs> trying to keep him out of jail. Hey, you yeah, know, it's a good thing. Um, but anyway, Kent, come on. We are honored and thrilled. Can't wait to see what you unpack today. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I love that about uh, what it will do. It's okay before we get out of here to, uh, is get you to send us to our next assignment from Georgia because our next one's Delaware. So uh, you'll be sending us to Delaware. Uh, and so that's probably significant too that we talk about that a little bit. Uh, interesting. Well, like my friend Ray Hughes, y'all know Ray, don't you? Yeah. Oh, he says, I am like a feel like a mosquito to nudist colony. <laughs> know what I'm here to do, just don't know how to get started. Love Ray Hughes. That'll hit you in a minute. Like. He's fantastic. So, just before we jump right into the four principles, what we'll be doing today is... Um, Diving a little deeper, I covered them, you know, briefly last night, these four principles that we have that we believe are transformational principles for the kingdom. But if you can just think with me of the mindset, it's not you're being taught, right? I mean, you're not being, I'm not teaching this to you. I really feel like I want to impart it to you, right? I mean, you can get the knowledge and that's fine. But if we can get it imparted to you, because the whole concept is that you actually are able to multiply and duplicate this. So that you can, after uh, very easily, after we spend some time together, you could now go take three or four or five folks in your sphere of influence and pretty quickly allow them to begin to step into this transformational process along with you. And when that starts happening, it gets really exciting, to be honest with you, when you start seeing instant transformation in your spheres of influence. There's a map. If you've, if you've got one of these uh, workbooks, you ran out. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. If you got, uh, there's, uh, there's a transformational map, and I wanted just to uh, briefly hit that this morning. Take me just a minute to find it. But this will kind of give us, this helped me immensely wrap my mind around transformation in general. Thank you, ma'am. 126. Is that right? There you go, perfect. You see a small transformation map there, and it's the low level is 20, is, uh, there's a, there it is on the screen. Uh, shame, guilt, fear, anger, right? And so when you, think about, when you think about who needs to be transformed, my old mindset used to be, do they know Jesus or do they not know Jesus, right? But my new mindset is, because I've lived enough life now, that I know people who do know Jesus, that are still living shame, guilt, fear, and anger, right? Then I know people who don't know Jesus that are living on that level of vibration. And so I'll call it a vibration. And so this, is, this really helped me to have the faith of, for transformation. Why? And we'll keep that map up just a minute because it's important. There's a study that was done by Dr. Marcato and they realized you could actually study vibrations. And, uh, and that you could study them. And there was also a study on water. And I don't know if you've ever seen that study. And how positive aspects could shift and change water. And how negative aspects could shift and change water. And so when you begin to think about that. For me, because it was hard to wrap my mind around how we're we going to transform a city. Right? How are we going to transform a state? I know the practical things we talked about and all the great prayer. I love the way y'all pray. I would, if y'all could just come over in Alabama and pray for a while, it would be amazing, right? If just y'all powerful pray, way you pray. But how are we going to shift and change something? And so that this thing really unlocked something in me. 
because they studied and found 80% of society, 80% of society live in shame, guilt, fear, and anger. 80%. And are, are, and are releasing that vibration into our atmosphere. So you wonder why all this chaos and anger and division, and, and, and you got to see the root. I mean, it's not the fruit. I mean, if you go back, it, you can choose any topic from politics to race. To, it's, there's, the, the goal is division. That's ultimately all that they're trying to accomplish. But it's because 80% of people are living on a low vibration. So my thought, how in the world are you going to change this? This is what got exciting. The study depicted that one person making any movement forward out of that into courage or gratitude, just that level, that vibration changes so dramatically that their vibration nullifies the negative vibration of 75,000 individuals into the atmosphere. So if you have one person that begins to move toward courage or gratitude, the vibration so shifts from them that literally it nullifies the negativity of 75,000 individuals living on a low level of vibration. If you, begin, if you ever move toward joy or abundance, it exponentially grows to thousands of individuals if you ever get over into peace and enlightenment and we'll start we'll move that on way on down the line uh, now it makes sense right Jesus on one act of love 2,000 years ago released a vibration that is still moving today That his act of generosity on the cross released such a spiritual vibration that 2,000 some odd years later, we're still recipients of that manifestation that keeps moving throughout the earth. And so when you see that, it, that's why we realize it didn't take a massive amount of us. I mean, it doesn't take a, you know, millions of people in a state to change a state. It just takes a remnant. And so when you, this helped me. Because now I realize my efforts, they may seem small in the natural, but they're really not. If, if, if you take five or six people in your spheres of influence and you move them down this map of transformation, they, and you can imagine, if one to put a thousand of flight, two, t you see the multiplication in it. So if you can imagine, if you start moving down the line, you start nullifying 75,000 individuals, you get five others, you're up to half a million people in the state. It just has exponential repercussions in the concept of transformation. And so that's why we're, we're so passionate about, and then uh, the way we started it was, we just decided what do we know personally that has allowed us to experience transformation. And uh, I started out seven years ago in my home with three young couples, and just as a test run to say, I'm just going to spend, we're going to eat once a week, I'll share what I feel like I have that's beneficial to you. If it works, fine. If it doesn't, you know, we'll, we'll do something else. And this is how we kind of started boiling this down and narrowed it down to these four concepts of transformation. So we'll talk about identity, alignment, empowerment, and assignment. Identity is where we, where we all start because we realize how important identity is if we're going to live a life of transformation. Jesus, of course, is our ultimate model in everything we look at. We try to base it on the theology of Jesus. And uh, so, you know, you see when Jesus was uh, basically baptized and the Father said, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased, before he ever done one miracle, before he ever did anything for God, he did it out of the acceptance of God, not to gain the acceptance of God. Right? We see that model there, very powerful. And immediately, the devil leads him into the wilderness to challenge that. Are you really that? And that's where we all, most of us, me being the chief of sinners, lose it because I'm so accustomed to basing my identity on my behavior. 
Have I prayed enough? Have I done this enough? Have I not did that enough? And so the enemy, if he can ever get us to buy into the concept or the trap of I am what I do instead of who he is, he gets us. The fruit or the beauty of why it's, why it's so powerful is we see Jesus, I think, in Matthew 13. It says, knowing he had come from the Father and was going to go back to the Father, humbled himself, took off his robe, put a towel around him, and washed the disciples' feet. Once we get secure in who we are, we'll do anything for God. Serve anybody, do anything. We don't have to be recognized as anybody special because our identity is not in what we do. It's who we are. And so, we know, probably most of you know all this, right? And you understand that. But then there was a depth of it I didn't realize. And it's the giftedness of God. And so, we all know 1 Corinthians 12, the Holy Spirit has nine gifts. Most of us know Ephesians 4, Jesus, these are gifts to the church, gifts to believers. Jesus, in Ephesians 4, has gifts to the church. Apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, and evangelist, right? But then God the Father has gifts. And when must, I didn't realize this, but these are to all of humanity. And they're found in Romans chapter 12. And there's seven of them. And these are given to every human being alive on the earth. This is important. So everybody's born, born with a gift. And there's seven of them. Prophet, servant, teacher, exhorter, giver, ruler, organizer, and mercy. Now, here's what gets exciting. Those seven are listed in order in all sevens of the Bible. You can't find a seven in the Bible that these aren't listed in order. So you go to the seven days of creation, in order are these gifts. You go to the tabernacle, the seven pieces of furniture, in order, these gifts. You go to the seven last sayings on the cross from Christ, all in order. You go to the seven churches in Revelation, all in order. And you can't find the seven, I think there may be a hundred sevens, our, our, our last study, that these gifts, this is to show you or prove to you the pattern or intentionality of God and the importance of this. And why is it important for, important for us to realize all humans have these? This creates value. Because every human being is valuable, not because of what they do, but because of what's on the inside of them. Every human has a gift that's supposed to be functioning, and it's a birthright. They're born with it from heaven. It's a birthright. And this will mess with some people's theology, but that's okay. Like I said, Apostle Jackie is... I've, I've, now I'm starting to see her book and stuff so she can fix all, anything. She's she got it. So she'll take me and she can correct it and fix it and make it just right for you. So, but but I, I, you don't get this gift when you get saved. You actually got saved because you've got this gift. Jesus was willing to buy your whole field to get the treasure. So he bought your sin your past, all, he paid for all of it. Why? Because he says he wanted the treasure that was in the field. So there's a treasure in you called a redemptive gift that's linked to your birthright. You are a word from God. Your mom and dad made these bodies, but, but the spirit that's in you is a word from God. And according to Isaiah 55, you will not return void. Sooner or later, the seed of destiny will break the husk of iniquity. And whatever's trying to stop you, this gift inside of you, if nurtured, will absolutely come up through anything that's trying to stop you. I've seen, I've seen a weed grow right up through concrete. Because of the giftedness and the, and the power that's in you, but, it's, but you have to nurture it. And if you don't know what it is, you don't know how to nurture it. As Sylvia Gunner teaches so powerfully on nurturing your spirit. And it's a key to this whole teaching, actually, is because it's the God concept of, nurt of nurturing your spirit. And so these sevens then, uh, 
start getting pretty interesting when you begin to look at them and begin to figure out and determine, you know, what, uh, what your gift is and how your gift flows and how your, and how your gift functions. So let's just start with the seven days of creation. That's a good, good way to start. Day one, right, uh, is the prophet. Because on day one, God looked in the darkness and spoke light. A, prophet, a, gift, a prophet's gift has the ability to look at chaos and turn it into order. Look at darkness and bring, and bring light, right? Second day is a servant. That's the day God, that God separated the firmament and uh, separated the waters. The servant gift is such a powerful gift because the servant gift has the ability to keep a ministry or an organization or a family cleansed with their heart for service. That's like the firmament. The firmament takes in carbon dioxide and releases oxygen. Keeps our whole atmosphere cleansed. A servant gift that has the ability to serve can keep an entire environment cleansed spiritually by their heart for service. Beautiful. Third day teacher made plants, right, that bore fruit after their kind so the seed would be able to be multiplied. The teacher, a true teacher, has the ability to take a very complicated subject, make it very simple, and multiply it. To speak, and all of a sudden, it just gets in you and multiplies because it's such a profound gift to, of multiplication. All teachers have a multiplying gift to take a, take a truth, take a principle, and multiply it. Day four, they made the stars, moon, sun. All the, this is the exhorter. This is, the, this is the, the one that can magnify God and make God big and uh, rally masses of people around an uh, 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 endeavor. You know, I don't know uh, what Apostle Jackie's gifts are, but I would be guessing to think she's definitely prophet, right? She moves it, that, but she's definitely an exhorter because she has the ability to move masses of people for purposes that God has to, to accomplish. And that's an exhorter's job. And when you start seeing this, you see how powerful we need each other. And we, instead of competing, we complete each other. So like Arthur Burke, who is the father of this, this, this conversation, actually, uh, is very, very powerful. He said, I'm a prophet. I have the ability to go into the spirit and gain information and knowledge and put it in a form that's presentable. He said, but if I communicate it to you, you're going to fall asleep. And it's true. I, it's so painful to listen to this man talk. And I listen to him a lot, but it is painful. I use it for sleep therapy. You know, like if I think, if I like, I can't get doze off, I'll turn Arthur on, let him teach for a while. Within five, six minutes, you're like, I mean, he's just dry as a bone. But my God, the knowledge is worth it. I mean, I'll, I'll just drink copious amounts of coffee to stay awake because I want what he's got. But he said himself, so my job isn't to communicate it to the masses. My job is to take this and put it into an exhorter's hands and let them tell the masses about it. That's why Sylvia Gunner came to me in, at, in 2008 when I started teaching this. And she said, Kent, you're much better at this than we are. Not that I'm bragging on Kent. I'm just saying I love the aspect that they're thinking kingdom community team ministry not it was my revelation i got it from god you can't ha Come on. freely i've received it freely give what would happen at the body of christ we got so secure in our identity that you know a prophet calls an exhorter god i just got a revelation let me let me send you the outline i need you to preach the hound out of it <laughs> not caring whoever gets the credit other than transformation occurs anyway i get i get i run, I run all these trails this is an exhorter Fifth day, made fish and birds. This is the giver, the nurturer. Fish and birds are the most nurturing animals on the planet. You can go to uh, New York in a concrete jungle, and a mama bird can build a most beautiful nest out of trash. Plastic and weeds and all. And she'll just build a beautiful, because they're nurturing by nature. Givers are nurturers, if you're a giver, if you have a giver gift. Ruler organizer. This is day six. This is when he created man. And said, you, you organize everything. Name the animals. Put them in place. Have dominion. Be fruitful. Multiply. Right? Very simple. Last day, seventh day, is mercy. It's when God rested. 
Mercy gifts have the ability to go into the sacred and bring it back to the secular. Most anointed worship leaders are mercies. Because they have the ability to go into a sacred place and bring it back to the secular realm. Most artists, they have the ability to, to, to conceive it and see it in a realm and bring it out. And you'll just look at that art and you'll just be like, oh my God, right? Because they had the ability to cause the sacred to manifest in the secular. It's a beautiful gift. And when you see all these gifts are functioning, moving together, right? Now, how do you know which gift you have? So, well, I've, I've got an assessment you can take. Hopefully you did that last night. If not, you can take it today. It takes about five minutes to answer these questions. It'll email, email you back free of charge. And it'll email you back your top three because you have to narrow it down. It's not just going to spit you out exactly who you are. You'll have to narrow it down with a little, little work that I'll show you how to do. But it gives you an idea. It gives you kind of a general concept. And, some, and now, ultimately, when we're like Jesus, we'll all have all seven. Jesus, had, Jesus was perfect. But, but for us, you'll have one that's what we call a grace gift. You don't have to do any. It's just who you are. You don't, you don't grow it. You don't advance it. It's just, it's just who, you, who, who you are. Uh, and then you'll have a side gift that kind of bolsters that gift. Normally, a couple of them working, working in your life. But it's very interesting when you see these, these seven gifts and how powerfully they function together in the day of creation. How do you know what yours is? I like to tell this story. This kind of helps people kind of in general come to a conclusion. Let's say we have a party. And in this party, uh, we've had dinner and we're about to eat cake. So the, cu the uh, person's coming out with the cake. They trip and fall, spill the cake. How we all respond kind of determines who you are. All right, so think about it a minute. The prophet, I knew this was going to happen. When I walked in, I saw that that furniture was totally out of order. And sooner or later, somebody's going to have an accident because that should not be right there. You prophets? The servant, it's not even their house. They found a rag and are on the floor cleaning it up. And they don't even, they don't, it's not even their house. Right? They will just jump right down on the floor and start cleaning it up. Right? The teacher, they're drawing a diagram to help you rearrange everything so this never happens again. And they'll have every detail of your house all organized for you before they leave and put it in your hand and every detail laid out so that hopefully this doesn't experience again. The exhorter, that's my, that's my gift, the exhorter. I just don't want the party to stop. So I'm like, ah, oh, don't worry about that. We'll figure that out. Hey, did y'all hear the one about da 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 I just tried to shift the, because I hate pain, and I'm living total denial of everything. <laughs> like, it just never happened. How about you exhorters in there, right? The giver, simple. He's already in the car to the store. I'll fix this. I'll buy a cake. It's easy. Money fixes everything. They're Ecclesiastes. Money answers all things. I'll go buy a cake. We'll quit talking about it. Right? The ruler organizer, they start telling everybody what to do. You draw a, guy, you draw a diagram. You clean it up. You go buy a cake. We call them bossy, but they're actually a ruler organizer. Where y'all at? All you real organizers are telling everybody what to do all the time. Right? The mercy motivated, that's the one. You know what this one, they go put their arm around her, and, and they lie. Because they just don't want you, they're like, you don't know how many cakes I've spilled. Right? Because they just don't want them to feel bad about it. Right? So you can begin to see, taste and see, kind of where you fit in that mode, which begins to help you identify, uh, you know, your giftedness and what God's uh, calling you to do. So the general overview of these sevens, and I'll show you some more of those in just a minute, is 
creation. Each design mirrors one of the days of creation. But there's also a principle that goes with each, each of these gifts. These, these appear in Proverbs 9, matching redemptive gifts, that says wisdom has built a house. Each gift is, is all also attached to a legitimacy lie. We wrongly think we can use, the, it, and the legitimacy lie denotes the primary means we wrongly think we can use to attain value or position based on what we do. Each redemptive gift falls prey to a different temptation in this area. When we don't find our intimacy in God, we begin to seek it from other people in our accomplishments. The enemy's tactics is there are seven curses. Isn't this interesting? There were seven enemies of Israel. When they went to the promised land. Seven enemies. Eat the Canaanites, the Amorites. You know all these ites. So these seven enemies, when you study them out, are the seven curses on the seven redemptive gifts. And your gift is tied to one of those enemies that you will have to defeat. To walk out your destiny. You will have to defeat that specific enemy. Now, isn't it interesting? If you don't know what enemy you have, you're fighting a lot of enemies that don't belong to you. I don't have to fight your enemy, but I got to fight mine. And you can't fight mine, and I can't fight yours because I have a specific assignment of the enemy to stop me. And until I know what that is, I don't know how to combat it. It's valuable information. There's a root iniquity. That's tied to each gift. And this is the common sin to most people with a certain gift. If we know the tactic and we see that emerging in our lives, we can quickly break the tendencies of this iniquity and these iniquitous patterns. The cross, and I'll show you this in just a minute, the cross dealt with every enemy. The last saying of Jesus was the declaration to break the curse over your gift. He said seven things on the cross in order to these seven redemptive gifts <laughs> to ensure we had the power to break out. And we, when we break the curses, there's a blessing. We want to position ourselves to receive the blessings. Each of these correspond to an Old Testament leader who opposed the enemy of God's people. You can go back and study the leaders that had these gifts that opposed the enemies of Israel, and you can me measure your life with theirs, see their pitfalls, and see their blessings. The seven pieces of furniture of the tabernacle, the place where God's manifest presence fell, also inside each of these gifts as they appear in the same order all throughout the tabernacle. Your birthright and destiny is tied to the seven churches in Revelation. Each correspond to a gift showing us the supernatural destiny of each gift. To he who overcomes, I will give this. To he who overcomes, that's all your giftedness laid out right in there. And so when you begin to look at that, look at this, you see some very, very powerful tools that you have in your hands to defeat the enemy. Not only that, it helps you live your whole life. Now you know how to navigate your wife. Now you know how to navigate your husband. Now you know how to navigate your children. Now you know how to staff your business. You don't want the wrong gift in the wrong space. I would not hire anybody until they took this test and I know who they are. Because I, I don't want a servant doing ruler organizer work. I don't want to tie down a ruler organizer doing servant work. And if I don't have people, mostly the time people don't succeed is they're just, they're not bad people. They're just in the wrong place, doing the wrong time. So most times for us to succeed as a minister, we have to move people laterally, not out. Because we just have them in the wrong spot. Because we didn't take time to help identify who they are and get them moving in that and, and, and get them free. And, it, and it, it's, I wish I'd learned it early on in my life, but... So my wife, Bev's prophet, Mercy, right? I'm exhorter, ruler, organizer. This is, this is uh, and I'm servant is, is measured up in there with me, a high one too. So but anyway, so this is our lives. Now, just to give you a quick story, so kind of give you another part of how this works like in a marriage. 
My wife's uh, sister died uh, unexpectedly. I, we, I packed up. I drove us to North Carolina. It was a terrible situation. We got through it. I financially paid the way for it all to happen, did the service, drove back. So we get back home, and I'm all over Beth, like, hey, you okay? You know, can, I be, can I be here with you? <laughs> and finally she just says, just leave me alone. I thought, bitch, what do you mean just leave you alone? Like, <laughs> I, I drove you up to North Carolina and did the funeral and paid the cost. Oh, leave me alone? I, I mean, you said that seven days ago, leave me alone. I wouldn't, you know. I'm just telling you. Leave me, leave me alone. But I didn't know all this then. See, she's prophet. She didn't need me all over. She needed me to leave her alone. Because she had to have space and time to process all this. Hindsight, I could have just gave her a hug and went and did anything I wanted to do. Play golf, work, hang out, and just spent eight hours away from her. And she would have thought I was the greatest man on earth. Because I gave her what she needed. But if it was me and she had left me, I would have thought she is the most terrible person on earth. Why? Because an exhorter's got to have people. I can't process by myself. I got to have somebody to help me process. I, I would have needed my house full of people. Because that's what gives me life. And so you realize I can't give you what I need. I need to give you what you need. But I can't do that if I don't know what you need. And, and, and when you, if you can get this, it's going to radically change. I can't raise all my children the same. I can't discipline them the same. I've got to do it according to their giftedness and how they would respond to this discipline. Changes everything. I can't talk to all of my employees the same. They're all gifted. I can't expect mercy people when I have a staff meeting to make a decision quick. They need time. They got to feel it. They got to feel it. Huh? I, I don't feel it. Yeah, yeah like, like I, I, I got to feel it, right? You got to give it two or three days to feel it. So, you know, for a long time, my, my executive director, I didn't, know, I didn't realize he's mercy. You know, I'd be like, I, and I'm exhorted, like, boom, 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 boom. here's what we're going to do. You know, I'll get a vision. I'll get you a vision every day. Like, we'll change Atlanta today. We'll go to Phoenix tomorrow. I mean, you know, I, yeah. I'm like, yeah. And if and if you don't do this and fast enough, I'll get tired and quit this, and I'll go do another one somewhere. You know, which, it, and I'm gonna tell you about the curse I'm under. No, seriously, I'll, I'm gonna show it to you very clearly, and you're gonna recognize it. But these mercy, not you personally. I'm not pointing at you personally. I'm just saying in general. But now I realize, wait a minute, if I'm going to change something, I need to give him two or three days notice before I want to change it and let him think about it and feel it. If he feels it, we're in. I mean, you can't stop him once he feels it. But I got to let him, he's mercy, I got to let him feel it. Right? And so, you, so it just begins to help you organize your entire life when you begin to see these things. Now, for example, I had this encounter wild encounter it was a dream powerful dream and the Lord Jesus Christ is walking with me and we're walking and we're trudging through the desert and he's got dirt mud on the side of his face and he's looking at me intensely and he didn't say a word but I knew what he was saying it was weird like I knew he was speaking but not words and he was saying you're killing me you're killing me and I, you know, and my linear thinking, I'm like, well, I can't be killing you. You already got killed. <laughs> like, he got up. I mean, like, I, but he was like, you're killing me. I'm begging him for the body of Moses. What is this? He's looking at me, you're killing me. I'm begging him, where's the body of Moses? I got to have the body of Moses. I woke up, I thought, that's the strangest thing. Then I got to studying this. An exhorter lives under a Canaanite curse. I say yes to everything and everybody. 
and I'm a workhorse. I will work day and night 24-7. Not in a good way. Because I want to please everybody. I will do it to my own detriment. I will help you build your ministry and ne neglect mine. But what happens is, I put everybody around me in an oppressive workload. And everybody around me suffers terribly. Because, I, because of the curse that I was living under, saying yes to everything and not being willing to, the principle I'm designed to live by is sowing and reaping. But I never want to take that time for that to happen. Like, I want to talk to you today, and I want Georgia changed tomorrow. I'm not willing to sow five years, 10 years, 25 years. What does it, who cares as long as it gets done? But an exhorter's curse won't allow them to do that. Moses was an exhorter. So he... He knew what he was supposed to do, right? He saw injustice. He killed two Egyptians to save two Israelites. He knew what he knew he was a deliverer. He was ready to do it then. And God sent him 40 years to the back of the wilderness to prepare him because he knew as an exhorter, if he didn't have 40 years of waiting, he would have outrun everybody in the wilderness and killed all of Israel. He'd have ran them in the dirt. But because he had to spend 40 years waiting on God, he knew, I can only move when the cloud moves, and I, only can, and I have to stop when the cloud stops. And God broke the curse off his life in the desert for 40 years so that he could lead 3 million out in one night. Why is it worth waiting? Because your destiny is probably so much bigger than what you think. Moses' mentality was take one or two out at a time. Moses menta God's mentality was you'll take 3 million out in one night if you'll just wait on me. And let me develop in you what you need. Isn't that powerful? And so when you begin to see these, your purpose, your gift, your calling, and begin to look at them, uh, you, can, you, you can see uh, see it very clearly. Let me just hit a few of them with you, if that's okay. Kind of give you just a taste. Uh, let's, let's just choose profit, if that's okay. So profit, day one, creation is God spoke. And creation, and creation came into order. The prophet has the highest authority over the poverty spirit. As the prophet carries a God-given capacity to speak order into chaos. The prophet gift has the, has the, the highest authority in the spirit to speak order into chaos and to stop poverty. The principle that they should live by is design. The prophet can see order in God's word and his precepts. They desire to build their lives and the lives of others around design. The prophet can also see God's unique calling, his stamp of identity, or another person often calling it forth. A prophet has the ability to look in your life, call out your destiny, and give you a design how to build. It's powerful. The legitimacy lie for the prophet is... I can solve my own problem and fix things better than God. Because you have such an ability to create order and fix things. You, you begin, the lie is you can actually, because you actually can most of the time fix it. But the lie is you can't do it on your own. The prophet feels important and needed when fixing broke things. When unhealthy, they can come across as judgy when they're unhealthy. The enemy's tactics is an Armenian curse on the, on the prophet. This is found in Genesis 28 where Jacob worked seven years for Laban in exchange for Rachel's hand in marriage. But on the wedding night, Laban swapped bribes. And Jacob didn't know until... He consummated the marriage. Laban, an Armenian, didn't trust God to provide a suitable husband for Leah, an older, less attractive daughter, so he solved the problem in his own strength. And lots of fractured relationships are a fallout from the prophet because they're so misunderstood. And you have to defeat that Armenian curse 
the power Jesus released on the cross to help with that? What? First thing he said at the cross, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Jesus released the power of forgiveness to the prophets so that they could deal with all these fractured relationships that when they're misunderstood, just to simply say, Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. The blessing that you need as a prophet is the blessing of a Hosea who had an unfaithful wife. He had to hold her to God's standards, yet he did, did it so graciously. And in time, she turned her heart towards him, and she eventually referred to him with endearing term, husband, rather than the cultural term, master. Hosea had the ability to take a situation, over time, change her heart, and turn it toward himself. That's the prophet's job. Over time, turn people's hearts toward God, even though they're some of the most rebellious, stiff-necked, hard-to-deal-with people in the world. Isn't that something? The tabernacle, the first piece of furniture, the brazen altar, it's the first piece of worship we would see in the tabernacle. This is where God cleared sin so they could go further into the relationship. This was the starting point to walk in true spiritual depth, not the finish line. In the same way, the prophet brings confession of sin, not condemnation. That is, a prophet points to the sacrifice, not the person's shortcomings. All this is about the prophet. The birthright or destiny, the prophet's birthright. Their true spiritual DNA is to help others see their true identity. To see themselves as God sees them. They call forth the kingdom greatness inside of others such that it shines forth. The church of Ephesus is the example from the book of Revelation. They couldn't tolerate wickedness. They persevered. They overcame. However, they were in danger of losing their first love. Of becoming more enamored of pointing out the shortcomings than staying enraptured by the Savior. That's the birthright of the prophet is that church so you can see there's so many layers and depths of this that you can dive into and you can study that begin to unfold who you are I've learned more about who I am by the curses than the blessings because I can see what I've gone through I see the pain that I've caused others I see the the shortfalls in my own life so I identify with that more readily than the blessing part and it takes both for, for, for me to o- overcome. But you can begin to see that so powerfully. And so I won't take all your time to go through every, every one of the gifts. But you can see the patterns, what I want you to see. That you can take yours and follow the pattern. And follow it out to the place that you begin to really see your warfare. See who you're called to be. And, and step into that. And it's really powerful when you look at that. The tabernacle, the, the altar was the prophet, right? The laver, the washing, is the servant, right? The lampstand is the teacher. The showbread is the exhorter. You see that all, 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 all the way through. The giver, the worship, the, ru- the ru- ruler organizer, the, mer- the uh, ark of the covenant, the mercy seat, the mercy gift, all in order. The last, and you see that now, in the tabernacle is the pattern. I believe all spiritual things lay over the tabernacle. That was God's pattern, so that's very, very important. The cross, uh, the uh, first one we looked at, prophet, right? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. The, the servant, the second thing Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. That's the blessing. The thief had nothing to offer Jesus, yet Jesus saw him as God the Father does. He facilitated the repentant man's transition toward the kingdom of God. Servants do this. They agree with God, and they confirm that that what they see, the washing of the water of the word. How about uh, the teacher? Isn't this something? I never thought about this until I saw saw this. The teacher's downfall or pitfall is selective responsibility. Teachers, this is their number one downfall. They, are, they have selective responsibilities. They won't be responsible for, for, for things if they're not teaching it. If it's not in their, fla- in, their, in their lane. Jesus on the cross, on the, th- on the third thing he said for the teacher, isn't it interesting? Behold your mother. Told John, a teacher, behold your mother. He gave him a a specific responsibility of not only transmitting supernatural information, but also to to others, but also living out the ramification of God's principles for himself. He said, not only are you going to teach the word, you're going to take care of my mother. I'm not going to let you have selective responsibilities. You can't just teach, you got to do. 
in Acts, it says Jesus began to do and to teach. A lot of teachers get a downfall. They want to teach but don't do. They make good professors. But to apical, to act, living it out. And so, just wild, isn't it? The exhorter, this is mine on the cross. What Jesus say? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Rejection is severely, exhorters deal with, take rejection very, 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 very powerfully. Uh, Jesus felt the separation. Though we will never be separated from God, or exhorters must learn to not base their interpretation of what God is doing on external circumstances. So I, so I can, I, as an exhorter, if, 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 if the anointing's not flowing, if God's not blessing, if things aren't growing, if, they, if we're not having breakthrough after breakthrough, I can begin to believe that I'm out of relationship with God because I base it on my circumstances. And I feel rejected when I'm not blessed. But how many of you know you're not blessed all the time? Like God's not just going to keep blessing you because if he keeps blessing you, he'll keep doing things he doesn't want you to do. God can't bless my stupidity. <laughs> right? And I sometimes just get under a stupid spirit really quick. And God's like, uh-uh, we're not going to do that. Right? So you got to be careful with that as an exhorter. But it was handled on the cross. A giver, fifth day, simply said, I thirst. Why givers have to be very careful because they know how to give, but they don't know how to receive. Mm -hmm. So Jesus dealt with that on the cross. The ruler organizer, I love this one, it is finished. Because ruler organizers are always dealing with not being able to get to, you know, you got so much that you're organizing, you can't get to the finish line. But you have the freedom to serve at a higher capacity, knowing God manages and holds the future. And the burden's not on you to make sure it happens. Lastly, mercy, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. In effect, Jesus offers himself completely to God. He does this amidst pain. Many times, people with the gift of mercy tend to withdraw from God when facing a struggle because when unhealthy, they feel like their faith is more of an exchange. And so Jesus dealt with that on the cross. So hopefully now you're kind of finding some thoughts about who you are, where you are, uh, what you're what you're gifted, gift is what you're bending toward. Hopefully you've been able to take the redemptive dip the gift. And so what we've done is Arthur Burke has written prayers of blessings and prayers of renunciation. And they are powerful. And when you pray those prayers of renunciation over you, over your family, over your spouse, over your children, over each other in ministry, it releases some things that I've never experienced any other way. And then when you speak the blessing onto your giftedness, then you begin to, to realize how powerful that is and what you're called to be. And so... In this moment, <clears throat> I want you to experience it if you can. And this is something that uh, Apostle Jackie would know, very familiar, being mentored by Sylvia Gunner. But your body, soul, and spirit, you know that, of course. And this whole concept of nurturing your spirit was actually a long process. But to realize that your spirit if nurtured, becomes the strongest part of your life. So you are no longer led by the flesh, you are led by the Spirit. But what happens is, we don't understand that, so we spend so much time nurturing our children's body, physically, we nurture their psyche, emotionally, but we don't nurture their spirit. So most people grow up with a healthy body, uh, you know, relatively strong soul strong willed too strong exactly and a very small spirit these gifts are designed to function out of your spirit right because that's actually who you are and you'll feel it here in just a minute you'll you'll you'll, you'll feel what i'm telling you 
because it, don't you love a God that we can feel? But it's, it's, it, it's, it's in, your, in your spirit because your spirit is eternal. Your spirit is, is always was, always is, and always will be. That's how Jesus was crucified from the foundations of the world and you were there. They sang that old song, were you there when they crucified the Lord? Yes, I was. Because my spirit has always been. I am eternal. I've always, I am God. I am as God, eternal. My spirit, my spirit doesn't have a beginning or an end. It's eternal. So if this body falls off today, I'm still standing. Right? Isn't that cool? And so the way they came to this conclusion is they took 100 case studies of pregnant women and and they did the study where the the child in the gestation gestation process the brain stem was not yet connected so there's no way there was cognitive understanding it was only spirit in a hundred cases they got the room extremely quiet to where you couldn't hear the heartbeat or feel the heartbeat in the, in the baby. Dark room. And the doctor would say, this baby's dead. And every time, as soon as the doctor said that, the baby, bam, kicked. No, I'm not. <laughs> Demonstrating, proving to them the spirit was there and knew the truth. You can't lie to my spirit. You can lie to me. You can lie to my psyche. You can give me a lying symptom. You can throw a lying thought at my mind. But you cannot lie to my spirit. I don't need an anointing. There's an anointing that abides within me that's been given to me by God that knows the truth. And when that thing gets big and you start living out of this, everything starts changing. And that's what your gift is designed to do. So I want to just show you an illustration and and bless you with this gift, whatever your giftedness may be, and pray for you in a specific way at this moment as I've been instructed, trained by Sylvia Gunner, these friends of mine, to bless you. Is that okay? So, Father, we thank you today. Thank you, Lord, for these beautiful people. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for Sylvia. Thank you for Arthur. Thank you for how you've blessed them with this knowledge and shared it with us so that we could share it with others. And so in this moment, I simply call your spirit to attention. I ask that your spirit come to the forefront now of this conversation. That your spirit connected to the Holy Spirit now begins to receive the impartation of the created redemptive design that God created you to live in. I cordially invite your soul to come in behind your body behind your spirit and your body behind your soul that you are aligned spirit soul and body and I speak to you spirit God smiled the day you got that body he knew you were going to find an expression in the earth while you were in your mother's womb He formed you and fashioned you, wrote a book about you. All your days have been written of all that you would do and all that you would accomplish. He gave you all 10,000 pairs of the chromosomes you needed to exist. He uniquely designed you and created you specifically with your birthright so that you would live out your destiny and purpose with power and integrity 
and great joy and great peace. You are loved. You are honored. You are cherished. The God of all of heaven specifically created you, designed you, gave you the parents you needed. Let you be born into the circumstances that were necessary. How, even how difficult they were. So that you could find your design and your redemptive abilities in the earth. You are chosen. You are called. You are sent by the Father himself. So I bless you. I bless your spirit. I bless your spirit with knowing you are eternal. You no longer have to fear death. You don't have to fear anything, actually. Because you are eternal. Just like Jesus, you came from God, and you will be going back to God. Therefore, you will find a humility to serve humanity at whatever measure God asks you to do because you are so secure in who you are and who your Father is. I bless you prophets because you have the divine ability like creation on day one to speak order into chaos and light into darkness. I bless those prophets in the room today that you will walk in that ability and strength in a supernatural way in this season. I bless you servants with the ability to continually cleanse the atmosphere of your spheres of influence so that Holy Spirit has free reign in whatever influence you're in because of your service to others. You keep the atmosphere totally cleansed and washed just like the laver washed them as they entered the tabernacle in the presence of God. I bless you teachers with the innate ability to multiply truth as seeds are sown into others. As you begin to teach and sow into the next generation that you find a multiplication that you've never had before because of your giftedness. I bless you exhorters to shine bright, make God big, magnify God. Let people see how big God is and how great he is and how powerful he can work in our lives as we give him our attention. I bless you givers, you nurturers. You're securing generational blessings. You're securing inheritances for the next generation because of your ability to nurture and give. I bless you ruler organizers, just like when he created man on the sixth day and gave him dominion and authority to be fruitful and multiply, that your efforts begin to be multiplied and fruitful. I bless you mercy gifted folks, that you have that innate ability to go into the secular or the sacred and bring it back into the secular, that you will begin to sense and feel and hear and see God in a way you've never done it before, and that you can manifest that through your gifts, through worship, through art, through writing, through poems, through songs. I bless you. You are a word from God. God spoke you into existence. And you will not return void. Before you return to your Father, you will have accomplished everything. That God has sent you here to do. The good work that he started in you. He will finish it. For the glory of the kingdom of heaven. And in Christ's name. Amen. You can feel that. Can't you? I do every time I get involved in it. Because it's spirit to spirit. All right. You want to take a little break? Huh? Okay. Not long. How long do you want to break? Ten minutes? All right. Is that okay with everybody? I know I'm giving you a lot of information. And anytime you want me to be quiet, just tell me to shut up and I'll quit. So five after 11, we'll jump back. This is the most intense session, by the way. So, I mean, the others, I'll hit you 
some you know, I'll, I'll get it to get the share, but this to me, this is the most powerful. Now, before we get too far away from this, within the next 24 hours, if all po- if all possible, if you could, uh, uh, if you can't, if you don't have a book, it's online. You can actually capture it online, so you can r- read the prayer of renunciation over the gift that you feel it, it or have measured out to, and read the prayer of blessing. I would also encourage you to have somebody do it with you. It's just powerful when you do it together with somebody, whether it's your spouse or somebody you work in ministry with. It's just something when somebody's doing, especially the blessing part, uh, when, when uh, uh, they, they bless you. Uh, there's a product available that Sylvia Gunners that's called Nurturing Your Spirit, and she has a little small book called 40 Days of Nurturing Your Spirit. It's a paragraph every day, and that you can just actually every day just speak right into your spirit and this gift that you are, and it's powerfully uh, transformative. My last name, Gunter, G-U-N-T-E-R, Sylvia Gunter, S-Y-L-V-I-A, Sylvia Gunter. She's in Birmingham, Alabama. She's in Carolina now? Yeah, his Sapphire Leadership. Uh huh. Oh, Arthur. We'll play him for a little bit and take us a little nap, then we'll get back going. <laughs> All right, we'll see you in five, five or ten minutes.